Okay, so I'm Rachel and I'm 45 years old. Um, I live in a little village called Almondsbury, which is very near, um, or like on the outskirts of a big city called Bristol, which is in the United Kingdom. In my case, I think they wrote me off as a bit of a hypochondriac because I was always at the doctor. Um, there was a reason, like I had recurrent illness, you know. <laughs> But I think they thought, oh, you know, here she is again. And I don't think they took me seriously. But I, I, I went because I knew there was something really, really wrong. I kept going back because intuitively I knew something was wrong. I think that uh, I had cancer for a long time. Um, I was a lot heavier in my 20s. And in my 30s, I remember I kept saying, I seem to be losing weight and um, everybody knows that middle-aged women tend to gain weight as they get older rather than the reverse so I always just thought well I just must be one of the lucky ones <laughs> um, so my weight loss was very very gradual and very very subtle um, so that in itself looking back was a bit of a red flag um, and then with my son um, I was really really ill when I was pregnant with him I had obstetric cholestasis and I've actually researched, uh, there's a link between pregnant women who have obstetric cholestasis in pregnancy, uh, they're far, um, they're at greater risk to, uh, to go on and develop cancer after, um, which is, I think that's probably either I had cancer before I was pregnant with him, or if not, that might have sparked things off. But yeah, there is a link out there. Um, so yeah, I was really unwell with him actually. Um, the nausea was insane. Um, I had itching on the palms of my soles, uh, palms of itching on the hands, hands and feet and all that. Um, he was, I was induced, he was born early because there was a risk of stillbirth. Um, and then when I had my son, I, I lost a lot of weight quite quickly when, and I know that, you know, a lot of women sort of takes them a while to sort of regain their shape, but it didn't take that long. And there's a picture of me um, giving him milk and um, yeah, I look really quite slender. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, that happened quite quickly, <laughs> lost the weight quite quickly. Um, and then for years and years and years, I was recurrently ill. Like I was always poorly. And my husband kept saying to me, you're always ill, you're always poorly. There's always something wrong with you. And I kept saying, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. But actually, in hindsight, I look back and I was always ill. And it was um, several respiratory tract infections, one after the other. I mean, you name it, I got it. Whatever was going around, I caught it. So tonsillitis, bronchitis, um, a whole heap of stuff. Um, I kept losing my voice. So I was a singing teacher and I had to keep cancelling singing lessons because I kept losing my voice through illness. Um, and this kept going on and on and on. So whenever I got ill, it would go to my chest and I'd lose my voice. Um, it was just getting ridiculous, the amount of lessons I had to keep cancelling. Um, and then that kind of cleared up and it went away. Um, but yeah, looking back in hindsight, I think that was all part of it. So I had recurrent nosebleeds. There is a mention of it in my medical notes. It does say nosebleeds. Um, it's just mentioned the once, but it happened a lot. Um, and my husband will vouch for this. I kept saying to him, oh, look, another nosebleed. Oh, look, another nosebleed. And I can remember all these tissues going in the bin with, with bright red blood all over them. Um, and I can remember it, it kind of used to coincide with my cycle. Um, and I think around about the time when I miscarried, I think I had a nosebleed. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that I had cancer during my second miscarriage. And I'm convinced that my body could not cope with that pregnancy because I was dying. So basically when I knew that something was really, really wrong, it was uh, spring of 2020 when COVID first arrived and I was just pushed to the side because the doctors had far more interesting things to be getting on with, <laughs> more important things. Um, and I remember saying, oh, there's a rash on my arm. And I remember them saying, oh, it's eczema. And I remember saying, no, I don't get eczema that way. Um, and I remember them saying, yeah, you know, it's eczema. Anyway, that rash kind of went away and it came back. It came back with a vengeance in the spring of 2022. So about a couple of years later. And this time it was worse than the previous time. And again, they kept telling me it was eczema. Um, 
which didn't sit well with me. Um, and in the end, I asked to be referred to dermatology, thinking it was a dermatological issue. Um, and that proved to be a bit of a dead end, to be honest. But um, yeah, they, they took a biopsy of my leg and that came back as eczema molluscum contagiosum. Um, my frustration level was mounting by this time. And I can remember thinking, what is it? I know there's something really, really wrong and no one can get to the bottom of it. Um, so we're about to sign me off and um, say bye bye, you know, all the best, open appointment in the next six months. If it gets worse, you know, you can come back. Otherwise, you'll need a fresh referral from your GP. And I was like, OK, all right. But, but before I go, please, can you have a look at my leg? Um, by this point, I had lumps on my legs. So I said, I've got this lump and um, on my leg. And she said, how long has it been there for? And I was like, I don't know, like a week or two. I'm not, not, really, not entirely sure. And she said, mm, uh, and you could tell that she had places to go, people to see. And her response was basically, keep an eye on it, which didn't sit well with me. And again, my frustration was beginning to get higher and higher. So I went away and I did keep an eye on it. And in one lump turned into two, into three, into four. And before I knew it, I was covered in lumps all up and down my legs. And... Uh, I went back to the GP. I very nearly didn't because I was told that they'd done they they'd done absolutely everything they could do for me. Um, but I just thought, well, what else am I going to do? I guess I go back to the starting point now. I go back to the drawing drawing point. Say hello. I've got lumps on my legs, and the doctor said, "Have you have you been poorly? Have you been ill?" And my first response was, "No, no. My chest is fine. I haven't been unwell. I don't have a um, a virus or an illness or anything like that." Although it went through my head that like maybe a couple of years before, like I said, I kept losing my voice, singing teacher, kept getting recurrently ill. But that was kind of in the back of my mind. And I was thinking, no, no, I'm absolutely fine. I haven't been unwell. Anyway, he said, I'm going to send you for a chest x-ray. I think it could be something called tuberculosis. So I'm thinking he's like completely going down the wrong path. But by this point, I'm absolutely desperate because I'm covered in this rash all over my body literally the only place it wasn't was my face fortunately but like everywhere um my arms my legs oh gosh tummy back chest you know you name it it was everywhere and it was so intensely itchy um it was keeping me up at night i couldn't sleep in the daytime i was constantly applying applying cooling cream all over my body it was just ridiculous. So I thought to myself, I'll jump through any hoop you want me to, because at least then I can say I'm not only complaining, I'm actually doing something to help myself. So I went for this chest x-ray thinking it would be a waste of time. And actually the results came back that um, showing that I had a shadow on my lungs. And I just thought, what on earth? Where has that come from? So the next stage was to fast track me to hematology. So I was sent for a CT scan. And that revealed that I had um, enlarged lymph nodes in my chest and in my neck. And then after that, um, it was a needle biopsy. So they stuck a needle in my neck and extracted three samples of a lymph node. Um, that came back as what they thought was stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. They said to me, uh, we want to do a full body PET scan just to make sure we know what we're dealing with. And actually, the full body PET scan revealed that I was actually stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma and that it started to creep into the edge of my lungs. And I asked the doctor, because um, I was on the fence about whether or not to take the chemo because life had been pretty rubbish. And I just wanted to know what my options were, basically. And I, I said, look, I'll ask this question because if I don't ask it now, I'll never ask it again. If I don't take the chemo, how long do I have? And he said six months. I didn't want to lose my hair. I was absolutely petrified of losing my hair. Um, I've always had really good hair. <laughs> I've had long hair. I've taken good care of it. Like as long as I can remember, I've had my hair long. And I I, I said I'd literally, I would rather die than lose my hair. And I was not joking. I'd literally rather die. The whole, the thought of it falling out and all of that, just it scared the living daylights out of me. And also, you know, the fertility thing. And um, I have my son who I'm really, really grateful for, but um, I've always had a longing for another 
and I suffered a miscarriage a few years ago, lost a baby. And that was my second miscarriage in my life. And basically, I talked it through a lot with my husband, my sister-in-law. Um, my sister-in-law set me up with a psychologist, nutritionist and physiotherapist, all through um, the clinical nurse specialists. And so I did a lot of talking and, yeah, just decided to get on with it, basically. So... I decided to take the chemo and very sadly it coincided with my parents' golden wedding anniversary and I couldn't go. I started chemo on October the 4th. So when it was their golden wedding anniversary, I was feeling very sorry for myself in bed having had my first chemo. My chemo, it was a cycle was made up of two, two lots of infusions. Um, so my treatment was every two weeks I would I would go in and have these IV drugs put in my pick line when the pick line went in oh my goodness that was excruciatingly painful um and then it, yeah <laughs> and then I had chemo on the same day as well so that was the first the first chemo session was made up of the pick line going in and um my first lot of chemo so my 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 chemo sessions were once every two weeks for six months. Um, and every other week I would have a pre-chemo appointment to make sure that my bloods were behaving themselves and doing what they should be doing so that I was well enough to, to go through it all over again. And it was called ABVB. Side effects from the chemo were, gosh, like I used to be able to just list them. <laughs> um, I looked them up recently. Basically, it was, yeah, I felt very, very cold when the chemo went in. My whole body was really, really cold. Um, the nurse said to me, um, it's because I think it goes in as room temperature instead of body temperature, and it makes the body really, really cold. Um, so immediately, I could tell when it was going in, I could feel it. And it was like this kind of almost like a throb, 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 throb. Um, Yes, yeah, so it felt cold and immediately started bloating up like a balloon. I could feel my stomach just swelling when the IV drugs were going in. Um, immediately started feeling quite nauseous. I started feeling unwell in the chemo chair. Um, yeah, the first time was the worst, definitely. But And then towards the end was the hardest bit as well. But basically, I would come home, get my pyjamas on, go to bed, um, feel very, very nauseous, very, very bloated. Um, I'd have a lot of stomach pain. And I'd basically just have to lie there and wait for it to just ease off and get a little bit better. And then, yeah, basically, I'd have a lot of literal pain in my legs, like a burning sensation from fatigue. Um, yeah, just yeah, my legs would sort of give way on me. Um, when it got to the evening, I literally felt like, how on earth am I going to get to bed? Because I don't have the energy to clean my teeth. I don't have the energy to put my pajamas on and all of that, that tail end of the day. I come so close, but how am I going to do that last bit? The fatigue was just insane. I remember trying to climb the stairs and literally thinking, I just can't make that last step. Oh, um, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd feel really thirsty straight away. Um, I'd drool a lot on my pillow, be a lot of saliva. Um, I'd gassy, just gassy, gassy, gassy the whole way through. Um, I suffered with hemorrhoids, um, constipation, um, ulcers, cuts, angular colitis, cuts at the corner of my mouth. I, apart from the side effects, everything went amazingly well in terms of progress. So two cycles in, I had a PET scan and that showed that I had a complete metabolic response. And they said to me, we couldn't ask for better than that. Like that's basically, you couldn't better it at all. Like the, there is no better. That is the best thing that we could possibly hope for. Um, and everything in me wanted to say, what can we stop then? <laughs> uh, surely I'm cured. Like we can stop now. <laughs> we can stop with the drugs. Um, and by the way, it wasn't just IV drugs. It was like every day I had to take medicine at home as well. So I used to pill load my pill box and take pills at home. So steroids, um, 
dexamethasone and then an antiviral acyclovir and things like that. So my poor body was just flooded with with um, medication. So basically about four more months, I think it was, of chemo. So it was two cycles in. I think I had about four more cycles left. And then eventually at the end of the chemotherapy, I think it was about six weeks after it stopped, um, I was then sent for another PET scan and that showed that I'd had a complete response. So basically all the scans after chemo showed like the best possible results. Just I had a complete feeling of numbness absolutely numbness I didn't feel a single emotion when I was told I had the all clear and I felt guilty about that there was a lot of guilt wrapped up in well I get to keep my life but do I really want to keep living it because I'm really tired <laughs> um so I felt guilty that I didn't feel happy um but apart from that like I didn't feel happy I didn't feel sad I didn't feel shocked or confused or like I felt nothing really and I called, um, I don't know if you've heard of them, Macmillan, they're a charity, UK charity. And basically, if any of anyone in the UK who's, who's diagnosed with cancer, they're immediately given this Macmillan contact card. And basically a charity that exists. And um, yeah, there's a phone line that you can call. So I called the number and I said, I've been given the all clear, but I don't feel anything at all. I said, is that normal? And the lady was ever so kind. And she said to me, you're perfectly within your rights to feel exactly what you're feeling. Like the, the no judgment, no guilt, no, you know, whatever you're feeling, even if you're feeling nothing, that's completely okay. And it was really lovely actually to connect with someone and, and to hear those words. And that's all I needed to hear really. Be patient because your emotions do catch up. And regardless of what your spiritual walk is like in life, like whether you have a faith, or, or don't have a faith or, you know, give it time because eventually emotions will start coming out. Um, I do have a faith, I'm a Christian and I spent a bit of time with God and eventually got my head in gear. And now <laughs> I can say that that was not my time. For a long time, I kept saying to my psychologist, but that was my time to go. I feel like I shouldn't be here. There are conversations that are happening and situations where like, but I shouldn't be here. And it took a lot for me to get my head around the fact that actually, no, that wasn't my time. So I was incredibly fortunate that I got referred to a psychologist, um, a cancer psychologist of the NHS, and it didn't cost me anything. But I know that everything's wired differently in the States and you know, medical insurance and all of that. So I don't know if people have access to free mental health um but you know regardless of whether it's free or you have to pay i found it was absolutely necessary um in terms of processing and moving forward um and what what my psychologist and i found was that it not everything that i talked about was related to cancer um there was that but it kind of was in the same <sighs> There were things that we were working through that have that you know were issues before I had cancer. You who hold the stars and call them each by name will surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory. feeling really positive now um my life was saved it was saved for a reason and it starts with getting my story out there that's absolutely on my priority list <laughs> if there's any message that i want to get out there it's that um i actually had to give up working in the spring of 2022 because i really felt like something was really wrong and i just couldn't cope with working and my body was really clever my body was incredibly clever at telling me that something was wrong everything was shutting down everything was and i look back at those photographs and at the time i thought i looked pretty good i look back now and i think i look really ill like today if i'm not wearing any makeup i look quite healthy like i've got color in my cheeks and all of that but looking back i was going really kind of gray and and like you could see that my body was just starting to shut down and i i look in i look 
into into my eyes and I'm like that is someone who's really really ill and I you know I, us women we do we wear a lot of makeup don't we and we try to be the best version of ourselves and all of that and so half the time I don't think people really notice because I was just you know slapping on the makeup and I can remember doing school runs and thinking well it's a workout morning but I really ought to put a bit of makeup on because I look like death warmed up so I put on my makeup to do the school run and I'd come home do my workout wash my face take it off and put it all back on again if you yeah if you have cancer and you're still here to tell the tale a, I think you're still here for a reason. B, it's a, it's a chance to sort of regroup, isn't it? It's a chance to really look at your values, what's important to you, what you want your future to look like, considering you nearly didn't have a future. What do you want your future to look like? What's important to you? What what is what is really really important and what isn't so important? Your family life, work. Like, why am I here to begin with? Like, who made me? Where am I going? And so I think that it is life-changing. It's completely life-changing. It's a life-changing experience.